Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. It's my 20th episode for this series, so this means next episode. I've been doing this for about a year. Because 52 divided by, well, 2 is like 21, right? No, it isn't. 26. So almost, it's almost a year. I knew that. I was testing you. So, anyway, since we're on this, it seems appropriate enough, still, with the 20th episode, being something of a landmark, a nice round number, that this time Nintendo decides to make their second major change to Nintendo Power. Their first big one was taking the Fun Club News and going from a quarterly magazine to bi-monthly, and then from there into Nintendo Power itself. And, okay, so, sort of the third big change, depending on how you want to count it, but bear with me. And, from here, Nintendo decides to make the next big step and take it from a bi-monthly magazine to a monthly magazine. Meaning that, well, we're getting more content every month, or the, yeah, more content per month, more content on your prescription, on your subscription, um, and more games getting covered. Well, that's what you'd think, right? Well, not exactly. For this first year of being monthly to kind of gear up, they are going to do it in kind of odd fashion. Rather than every month a normal standard issue like we've been getting thus far, we're all, we're going to be alternating between regular issues and dedicated strategy guide issues. They will put, basically put a full magazine length thing of like a hundred or so pages, 150, 125 pages, all focused on one game. And this would go for basically the remainder of 1990, which is kind of, so not the volume year, meaning that if you'd started subscribing during, um, way, like right when Nintendo Power started, you would actually have to have had resubscribed at some point over the course of this. Um, so, with that said, I'm still going to be doing my normal pace. But for the dedicated strategy guide issues, I won't be focusing as much on the magazine as much as on the game itself. In the same way that I don't talk a lot about the strategy guides for the issues of Nintendo Power. I don't spend a lot... I, mean, I talk about, okay, here's what um, levels are being covered in the game. What, uh, or what's covered in the guide. Maybe specific tips and tricks. But I spend more time, but I spend more time talking about kind of what games they choose to focus on, and certain layout, um, eccentricities and art stuff and that sort of thing. In the same way, for the strategy guides, I'll be focusing primarily on well the game. I'll go in a little bit about the guide, but the guides can be comprehensive. They're going to cover everything. So I'll get briefly into art style and stuff. For example. Uh, we have the Final Fantasy guide coming up. How much of this is um, Yoshitaka um, Amano's art, and how much of this is original stuff, for example. Um, and how much do they spend, like, do they talk about, like, the music or any of this stuff about the creation of the game? And for, for any of the games, how much they talk about behind the scenes in the game, and how much they spend just focusing on the game itself. That sort of thing. Little stuff like that. Um... Those episodes will be a little shorter, but I think it'll be worth it. With all that business out of the way, let's get started talking about the issue itself. Our cover game for this issue is Super Mario Bros. 3. Since the first strategy guide issue is also for Super Mario Bros. 3, I'll be saving the review of that game for that episode. In the letters column, we have another story of NES survival. This time, this guy's NES survives his basement being flooded. Awesome. Now, if only the pins in the control deck could survive regular use. We get our first look at Super Mario Bros. 3, which I would be reviewing now if it weren't getting a strategy guide next issue, as I said earlier. As it is, we get maps and tips for Worlds 1 and 2. And then we come to Silent Service. We talked a bit about this in issue or so ago, I believe last issue, with the preview, but now we get a good look at the NES port of Sid Meier's World War II Submarine Simulator. We get info on what all the gauges do, 
and how, some advice on how to take out freighters without getting sunk by enemy destroyers. From a gameplay standpoint, Silent Service is a game which I played the hell out of, on consoles and on the PC, and it's probably one of the best submarine simulators of this era. The game has a load of in-depth customization options to make the game more of a realistic simulation, or to abstract some of the more sim simulationist elements of the game. But it's also been blown out of the water by most sub submarine simulators since then, particularly Ubisoft's Silent Hunter series. Honestly, the only thing that's really got going for it now is it's set in the Pacific Theater during World War II instead of the Atlantic, which means you get to play as a U.S. sub instead of a German U-boat. So, this is the biggest problem with most simulators on the NES. The simulator in question had a contemporary PC version, and by PC, it could be an Apple, or Macintosh, or MS-DOS, or, um, freaking heck, Commodore or Amiga. Those versions are better control-wise than the NES version. You have all of these buttons. You have your, you have all the letters in the alphabet. You have all the numbers. You have your tab, caps lock, shift, all that stuff. You have all these different buttons that you can, that the designers can map control things to. So rather than having to, um, navigate a sort of improvised sort of GUI interface, graphical user interface with the uh, D-pad and your controller's two buttons. You can map those all to just stuff on the keyboard and work it that way. If that's still too much for you, you can use a joystick or whatever, but still. Joystick or, or mouse or whatever. But still, you get my point. But even then, with this flight, if you're a simulator, if it's a flight sim or a submarine sim or what have you, if there's other games in the same genre that are out now, those versions are going to have a leg up over the older ones. The graphics are going to be better uh, because of modern technology. Um, and in some cases, some of these things which have to be heavily abstracted um, or just not implemented well at all on the older uh, computer versions are fixed. A good example here is plotting intercept courses in in Silent Service compared to plotting intercept courses in Silent Hunter. Some of the recent Silent Hunter games um, either automatically plot the intercept course for you, or if you just choose not to have it done that way, it'll still mark the location of the enemy vessels compared to your vessel on your chart, and then give you the tools, like the actual like rulers and all the sorts of stuff to map out the intercept course on your own, and it'll handle a lot of the, the geometry and that sort of math, math for you. Um, or give you stuff you can, like, give you the information so you can calculate it yourself, rather than having to look at the screen and do the equivalent of measuring the distance out with a ruler in your head, when instead you can just measure out the distance with a ruler with the ruler, sort of an in-game ruler, with the, everything to scale and so forth. So, honestly, over the past 23 years since this issue has come out, game development designers have learned so much more about designing simulators than they learned since then, whether the game is designed to be ultra-realistic or not, that it's hard to recommend simulators from this time at all. Aside from nostalgia value, or if you're because you're a collector of simulators, or anything like that. That said, I would love to see Sid Meier go. You know, I liked you know sound. I had fun making Silent Service. I want to make a new one because I had had fun playing this game when I was younger, and I had fun playing this game now. Um, it could still stand to use with some uh, improvements, though, and modern games are better than it in the simulation genre. Just straight up, if you put Silent Hunter against Silent Service, frankly like Silent Hunter 4 or whatever, Silent Hunter wins every time. Saying. We get a rundown of the stuff from Nintendo's booth at Winter CES. Unfortunately, though, the screenshots in this article are so small that there really isn't much you can get out of this article outside of a list of titles. Next is Pinbot, another pinball game for the NES, this one with a robot-themed table. The article gives a rundown of the game's features, and it looks like telling you the conditions you need to view the game credits. 
a score higher than 10 million points. Gameplay wise, Pinpot is an interesting pinball game. The game's controls are generally solid and easy to work with. The A button handles the right flipper and the D-pad handles the left. But the game has some problems with the graphics. The ball sometimes looks like it gets lost among the background, and the ball's movement is also very sluggish. Further, the upper right hand corner of the table is kind of weird. I have no idea what's going on there. It appears to be a spiral, plus a ramp, plus with some bumpers underneath it, but it's not clear. This is aggravated by the fact that the computer isn't really sure what's going on up there either, as on several occasions, I hit the ball up to that corner, and it's ended up falling back down to the plunger. Now, this isn't unheard of when it comes to real-world pinball tables, but I consider it rare enough that having it happen regularly breaks some of the game's illusion. We do have what is our either our second or third skateboarding game, depending on whether you want to count California games, with 720. This is a port of the arcade game of the same title. We get a map of the game's hub, along with some information on what you can do with, with your winnings as far as power-up items and so forth, and some tips on how to do well in the Class 1 events. Slalom, Downhill, Jump, and Halfpipe. Gameplay-wise, 720 has the problem that it's an arcade skateboarding game made in the time when people didn't know how to make skateboarding games. Tricks are difficult to reliably put off, and the game has time limits in the hub area that are clearly a legacy of the arcade version. The game also doesn't have the sort of late 80s style pseudo skater kitsch that Skater Die had to give it any sort of flair or character to it. I'd recommend skipping this game unless you want to collect retro extreme sports titles. We have a guide for A Boy and His Blob, the latest game from David Crane, the creator of Pitfall. While the article encourages experimentation, from what I've read about the game outside of this article has stressed that you need to make every jelly bean count. If you waste even one jelly bean, the game can become unplay unbeatable. We get maps of the first stage and some very basic short maps of Blabonia. Gameplay-wise, a boy and Bob is, in short, what you get if you make a side-scrolling Sierra adventure game. It's a game with character and flair, but also deliberately obtuse puzzles and a bunch of really fantastic ways to screw yourself into a position where you have to restart the game without realizing it, and also a game with some really cheap deaths. Now this game definitely has some interesting ideas, but there are ideas that are executed much, much better in the remake of A Boy and His Blob for the Wii. In Howard and Nestor, our two heroes are playing Super Spike V-Ball and getting their clock cleaned as Nestor is playing too close to the net. Though, now that I think about it, this is the first time the two have played cooperatively. Which is kind of, on one hand, it's kind of sad they've been competing for so long, but on the other hand, it's kind of cool seeing them team up together as opposed to being in opposition to each other in some form or another. Then we have the article for Wrath of the Black Manta, which is a Japanese ninja game with a similar plot to Shinobi and manga-style art for the Japanese version, but which has been changed to comic book style art after originally being planned when licensed for US release to be turned into an Aquaman game, but when that fell through, they just turned it into a generic ninja game with comic book art. Now, as far as the art change goes, I kind of wish they'd stuck with the manga art. Near as I can tell, the only reason why they changed the art is because they thought it was too Japanese. Now, to be fair, not actually fair, but by means of explanation. At the time, in certain aspects of American society, there was a certain degree of backlash against Japan because Japan was cleaning our clock economically because they were in the bubble economy. Um, again, look at movies like Gung Ho, the, um, the Michael Keaton Gung Ho movie, not the World War II propaganda film, um, where it's... It's kind of lampooning both American responses to Japanese business practices in the U.S. and how Japanese managers try but failed to handle the automotive industry in the U.S. and various other things. Um, or books like... Hell, just go back and watch my review on my other series, Breaking It All Down, 
of the novel Black Blade by Eric Van Luspader. I went into this a whole bunch there. I don't want to reiterate it too much. So I, so I can understand why, for vague reasons, they wanted to make the artless manga style, anime slash manga style, because they didn't want to risk offending people who had the then culturally acceptable racism against, well, dubiously acceptable racism against Japanese people. But, honestly, you're making a game with ninjas. Anyone who is afraid of something being too Japanese would be turned off by the ninjas. So you might as well just roll with it, do the manga-style art, because, hey... If people can handle ninjas, they can probably handle a art style that is different than what they're used to in daily life. And if you think that players will handle ninja, but consider characters with Slanted eyes to be too Japanese? That's just getting into being borderline racist. Or, either slanted eyes or, not borderline racist, it is racist. Slanted eyes or a different art style than what you're seeing in comic books. And by the way, some of the art here is plagiarized from the comic How to Draw Characters, the, not the comic book, the book How to Draw Characters the Marvel Way. So they're de- they're clearly trying to emulate American comics as opposed to Japanese comics. You're still kind of skating on the thin ice of unfortunate implications. Saying, as it is, Wrath of the Black Manta is a pretty straightforward clone of the original Shinobi, except its controls are iffy and generally not very well put together. The world has a bunch of secrets hidden in it, but because the instructions and clues hidden, hidden in the game are too poorly worded, I can't find them. The dramatic change in art style as well has stripped the game of any sort of character. All in all, this is a game which succeeds spectacularly at the task of being incredibly mediocre in every respect. Next is an article covering Astanax, a game which I'd hoped would get more coverage last issue, and which has gotten it. The game looks like something of an action platformer a la Castlevania. The game also has a normal high school student whisked to a magical realm plot, something which the arcade version of this game didn't have. I wonder if that's a change for the US release or the Japanese release. Anyway, the article gives maps for stages 1 through 5. The gameplay of Astanax is horrible. The jumps are terrible. The collision detection for character animations are abysmal. Sometimes enemies will pass right through your weapons without recognizing a hit, and sometimes you'll hit enemies without the weapon making contact. With the jumps, it's there's very little horizontal control in terms of how far you can jump forwards and backwards. This is and this is particularly bad when you're going up through a series of ledges. This game is just dire. There is no good reason to play this game, so, so, frankly, you shouldn't play this game. In the top 30, Jordan vs. Bird has entered the list this week, as has the soccer game Goal. I should probably pronounce this Goal, but that would be silly, so I won't. And I didn't previously do it, so, and if you, if I did... Or you think I did? You're wrong. We have a preview of Final Fantasy, and unlike the articles on Dragon Warrior, we have some of the art from the character designer for the game used in the article, specifically Yoshitaka Amano. We also have a preview of Codename Viper, which looks like a mix of um, the gameplay of Rolling Thunder and the plot of Clear and Present Danger, with a map of the first stage. Then we have Super C, did you like Contra? Well, good news. We're getting more Contra. There is a map of stage 1 and notes on stages 2 through 8. Now, again, I normally don't talk about the posters, but 
The B side of the poster for this issue comes with a complete world map of Four Dragon Warrior, with all of the towns and dungeons marked, and the prices for the various items in the various cities. We even get a little Dragon Warrior theme to choose your own adventure, done as a sort of tutorial for the grinding you do in the game. In the Game Boy section, we get a map of the first two stages of Nemesis from Konami, which is in the Gradius series. I'm not exactly sure whether to consider this a feature or a preview, but I haven't reviewed a Game Boy game in a while, so sure, I'll review it. Nemesis is a game that looks excellent, but plays poorly. Seriously, the first level of the game has some very, very de detailed graphics for the Game Boy, complete with what looks like parallax scrolling, except it isn't parallax scrolling. Let me explain. If you don't know already, parallax scrolling is a little graphical trick used in 8-bit and 16-bit games to give the illusion of depth of field in the environment. This is done by creating two or more graphical planes in the environment. One is the foreground plane. This is where your character is. This is where all the objects that your character interacts with are. Bullets from both sides, enemies, blocks you can hit, all that sort of stuff. The second is the background, which contains a whole bunch of smaller objects that move more slowly than the player does through the level, causing the level to scroll, that, that portion to scroll less slowly or more slowly than the rest of the level does as the player moves along. This gives the impression that those objects are far away. You also toss in some bit here with perspective in terms of like a tree in the foreground on the foreground plane is going to be smaller, or going to be bigger than the tree in the background plane. That sort of thing. Um, and because these objects are in the background of the plane and they're supposed to be far away, the player cannot interact with them. They, they are purely exist as set decoration, essentially. The thing with Nemesis is it looks like it uses parallax scrolling with the very bottom level of the, um, like top and bottom of the in level environment scrolling more rapidly than the mountains in the environment, but you can still crash into those slower moving mountains. You can still interact with them, so they're actually on the foreground plane, sort of. And this is kind of misleading, particularly if you've seen parallax scrolling before and assume, okay, this is parallax scrolling, even if you don't know what the term is. I can fly over those mountains and be okay. And this game isn't helped by the... Your ship has a slower mo um, maneuvering speed when you start out than the ship in Gradius does. Um, but, now be clear, this is a Gradius game. It's practically a remake of the first Gradius game with less weapons and guns. Um, but that slow start, that sluggish maneuvering speed to start out is a pain in the neck. And getting, and it's also a little too easy to get your speed moved up to the point where your ship is actually moving too fast at the level, and you end up crashing into things again. Um, but it still has plenty of stuff going through it, for it. It drops little bomb items fairly regularly, where if you, or bomb orbs, where if you fly over them, it clears the screen of all enemies. It also drops the power-up orbs significantly more regularly than the NES game did, and it has an option in here to just have turbo fire set by default, which is great because the Game Boy doesn't have... you, you, there aren't, you can't do aftermarket controllers for the Game Boy. You just can't. Um, so, and it works really well. Also, for that matter, if you die because the power-up orbs come so fast, it just makes it really easy to get yourself back up to your proper, for lack of a better term, speed. Um, it still has enough significant problems that I can't give it a solid recommendation. I definitely consider this a situation where you'd probably be better off with playing one of the actual Gradius games um, on your console, or if they have it through 3DS Virtual Console, um, playing it that way. Anyway, in the new releases, we have a preview of Tecmo World Wrestling, which is the first console wrestling game to feature move-by-move -move commentary. It's obviously not dialogue move-by-move -move commentary, it's an announcer box on the bottom of the screen, but it's still really cool to have this. It gives the game a whole bunch of verimicitude, verilicitude, I'm mispronouncing that word, but gives it a bit more sense of being like real wrestling, real pro wrestling. 
The game also has a whole bunch of serial numbers filed off versions of real-world pro wrestlers like Ric Flair and Ricky Choshu. We then have a preview of Abado X, or Abadox, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which is a shooter from Natsumi, which plays up the whole organic environment thing a little more than Life Force did. I do kind of love that how you can game developers back then are getting around Nintendo's violence issues by putting their spaceship game their space shooters inside massive organisms and basically it's okay if you have blood and guts as long as the blood and guts are from creatures bigger than a house. We also have another bases loaded game coming up with bases loaded 2 and an absurdly over the top baseball simulator from Culture Brain called, appropriately enough, Baseball Simulator 1000. In Counselor's Corner, we have information on how you can find Erdrich's armor in Dragon Warrior. In Classified Information, we have a password that will take you straight to Iron Mike, and we also have some advice on how to beat him. In Video Shorts, we have a look at Eight Eyes, which looks like a mix of Castlevania and Mega Man. In the NES Journal, we also have more dates for the Nintendo World Championships. Sadly, none of these dates are for Oregon. There's also a look at the NES 4 score, a multi-tap that doesn't require an infrared connection, which means it actually works. Our celebrity profile for this issue is Sarah Gilbert, who is, as of this issue, currently acting on the sitcom Roseanne as Roseanne Barr's daughter. Nowadays, though, she is currently on the daytime talk show The Talk alongside uh, uh, Sharon Osbourne and Aisha Tyler, and she's also having a recurring role on The Big Bang Theory. In Pack Watch, we have our first look at Ninja Gaiden 2, which fixes some of the problems that the first game had, particularly with the inability to climb straight up walls. Now, what I don't remember is if they amp up the difficulty. If they just fix the control problems but leave the difficulty the same, the game should be perfect. There's also notes on SNK's Zelda slash Ease style game, Crystallis, and the and the Chippendale Rescue Rangers game from Capcom. Also, Duke Togo returns in GoGo 13, the Mafiat conspiracy, now with 100% less variation in Golgo's facial expressions. Also, what's the Mafiat? Is it like some weird variation on the Mafia? Could they, like, not use the word Mafia in the title because Nintendo objected, but if they stuck a T on the end, then everything's fine? I'm curious. Anyway, before we wrap up the issue, we have our nominees for the 1989 Nintendo Power Awards. Now, I'm not going to list off all the nominees, but I will give my picks and let you take a nice long look at the categories while I give them. For Best Graphics and Sound, I'm going with Mega Man 2. For Best Challenge, Ninja Gaiden. Best Theme and Fun, also Ninja Gaiden. Best Play Control, Tetris. Best Character, Ryu Hayabusa, no matter how lousy a ninja he is. Best Ending, Ninja Gaiden. Best Player vs. Player, Tecmo Bowl. Best Overall, Tetris. <sighs> so, my picks of the issue. issue. This issue doesn't have a good lineup. It doesn't. The main titles of this issue, we have Wrath of the Black Manta, which was bad. Astinax, which was dire. The Nemesis showed promise, but it had control issues... And its poor implementation of parallax scrolling just hurt it. Buena's Blob has all the problems of uh, the Sierra Adventure games with making it too easy to screw yourself out of inventory stuff um, when you're doing the experimentation that you need to do to progress. It's the point where if you actually need to beat the game and want to beat the game, you have to get everything right. And if you mess up once, by the time you hit the point that you realize, oh, I burned too many beans, um, you have to start all the way back over from the beginning. And that's bad game design. So, 
For my multiplayer pick, I'm going with Pinbot. Pinbot has it lets you do a score attack between several different players, up to four. So, and it's also the kind of the only multiplayer pick here, but yeah, it's still worth it, worth something. And for my single player pick, Silent Service. Next time, though, we have our first strategy guide issue, and we're going to take a good, long, hard look at Super Mario Bros. 3. And that's something which I'm looking forward to and hope you are as well. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please give the video a thumbs up on YouTube or in the player or whatever, what have you, and subscribe to my channel to let you know when to get notifications for when the next episode comes out. I'll see you next time.